Episode 30 of the Free Range Texan Podcast is dedicated to my lifelong friend, Harlan Riddell. The following is an 18PR production. From deep in the heart of West Texas. And everybody knows Studio A or Ground Zero is at 18PR. And everyone knows 18PR is out yonder. It's a one of a kind worldwide transmission. Heroes and heroines file. The free range talent file. The Unexplained Files. The Ain't Love Grand File. Michael Sean's Campfire. And the Free Range Texan News Network. A clear and present detour on the road of everyday life. You're listening to the Free Range Texan Podcast. With our host, who's been voted the hardest working man in podcasting, Michael Sean. From the high rolling plains of West Texas comes episode 30 of the Free Range Texan. Coming up on our podcast, we have a little segment we call A Rancher's Reply. Foxy the Wonder Dog and I both have retained our position for one more episode. Oh, yes, and we want to thank those folks in Port Aransas. What a great group we've got down there. But those folks sent us the Jerky Meat Chews. Hmm... Well, myself and most of the crew were in the process of really enjoying them immensely. When we read a little further and saw they were actually dog treats. Uh, Foxy seems grateful. Well, with all that in mind, here's the advertising guy who was not present at the opening of said dog treats. This episode of Free Range Texan Podcast is brought to you by A-Team PR. Thinking about creating your own podcast? Let the crew at A-Team PR help. A-Team PR is a proud sponsor and producer of the Free Range Texan Podcast. For more information, go to freerangetexan.net. That's freerangetexan.net. As most of you know, every Free Range Texan podcast ends with a trip to Michael Sean's Campfire, a place where theater of the mind can transport our listeners to multiple times and places. However, this episode's Michael Sean's Campfire is not only a true story, but seemed to take on a life of its own as we started out by telling what we thought was a simple story about what a very real Davy Crockett witnessed in his final days on Earth. You may think you know the real story of the Alamo from John Wayne and Stuart Whitman, Billy Bob Thornton, or Fess Parker. But like most of our history, a lot of it has been rewritten. Our entire crew, including myself, found ourselves in tears a number of times. And we knew that the worst thing to do was to cut it short, to spend some time at our campfire. So let's saddle up and get ready to ride. Digital microphone will travel. You're listening to the Free Range Texan Podcast. (laughs) 
So did you hear about the Oregon rancher that received a government request to survey his property? Recently, Oregon ranchers Larry and Amanda Anderson received a letter from the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife asking for permission to survey their land in order to track a nearly endangered species. The letter requested use of the landowner's creek to document the amphibian life represented there, specifically the foothill yellow-legged frog, which is noted to have recently declined in population like farmers and ranchers. Well, don't get me started on that. But the Andersons weren't exactly interested in complying. The Andersons constructed one of the best comeback letters of all time. It goes like this. Thank you for your inquiry regarding accessing our property to survey for the yellow-legged frog. We may be able to help you out with this matter. We've divided our acreage into 75 equal survey units with a draw tag for each unit. Application fees are only $8 per unit. After you purchase the frog survey license, that's $120 for a resident and $180 for a non-resident, you will also need to obtain a frog habitat parking permit. That's $10 per vehicle. Then, of course, you'll also need an invasive species stamp, $15 for the first vehicle, $5 for each added vehicle. You will also want to register at the check station to have your vehicle inspected for non-native plant life prior to entering our property. This is also a day use fee there for $5 per vehicle. Now, if you are successful in the draw, you will be notified two weeks in advance so you can make necessary plans and purchase your Creek Habitat stamp. $18 for resident, $140 for non-residents. Survey units open between 8 a.m. and 3 p.m., but you cannot commence survey until 9 a.m. and must cease all survey activities by 1 p.m. Survey gear can only include a net with a two-inch diameter made of 100% uh, uh, organic cotton netting with uh, no longer than an 18-inch handle, non-weighted, and no deeper than six inches from net frame to the bottom of the net. Handles, on the other hand, can only be made of BPA-free plastics or wooden handles. After 1 p.m., you can use a net with a 3-inch diameter if you purchase the Frog Net Endorsement. That's $75 for a resident and $250 for a non-resident. Any frogs captured that are released will need to be released with an approved release device. As of June 1st, we are offering draw tags for our premium survey units. And application is again only $8 per application. However, all fees can be waived if you can verify native Indian tribal rights and status. Oh, yes, and, and you will also need to provide evidence of successful completion of frog surveys and you. The comprehensive course on frog identification, safe handling practices, and self-defense strategies for frog attacks. This course is offered online through an accredited program for a nominal fee of $750. Please let us know if we can be of assistance to you. Otherwise, we decline your access to our property, but appreciate your inquiry. Sincerely, Larry and Amanda Anderson.
I wouldn't mind living down the road from those folks. It started as just a dream from which grew a vision. All of us knew from the beginning that this whole concept would follow a path unlike any other podcast. We assembled a team and began production. And what has grown out of these humble beginnings is a totally unique podcast. Theater of the Mind lives. Part truth, part tall tales. Just take a look at what happen now. Visit our website at freerangetexan.net. Come along right out yonder on the Free Range Texan Podcast. Hi, this is Michael Sean. Welcome to our campfire. Get yourself some cowboy coffee there and make yourself comfortable. First, I'd like to say thank you to Dale L. Walker. Your book entitled Legends and Lies truly inspired me. And the story I'm about to share with our listeners now on our campfire program brought me to tears several times. Well, first, I'd like to point out that one of the most indelible and enduring images of Western American history was portrayed on television back February 23rd, 1955, in the final episode of Disney's three-part miniseries, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. Uh, Now hold your seats. There's quite a story here. Davy, portrayed by Fess Parker, is seen swinging his long rifle in the midst of an attacking force of Mexican soldiers. This program was for kids, so Disney decided not to show him dying. But the kids knew, as their parents had long known, that Disney and Fess Parker got this part of the story correct. That was how Davy Crockett died. Now, we may never have really believed that he was born on a mountaintop in Tennessee or that he killed a bear when he was only three. But we knew he died at the Alamo. In the heat of battle, a pile of corpses at his feet. Clubbing the enemy with his rifle, he called Old Betsy. Crockett played his part, and you might say he became trapped there at the Alamo by his own legend. It was over 160 years ago, March 6th, 1836, As the first glowing stripe of dawn rose in the eastern horizon, there was a bugle call. Then no less than 2,000 Mexican foot soldiers, cavalry and artillerymen, formed up in four columns and marched through the grass, their breath visible in the sunrise chill. The morning sunlight glinting off the hedgerow of bayonets. Each man was armed with a British-made musket, spare flints, and cartridge packs. Some carried nine-foot lances. Others had sabers pistols, picks, pikes, pry bars, axes, and scaling ladders. For 13 days, Santa Ana's artillery had pounded the Alamo, and during the siege, sharpshooters from the Alamo had succeeded in picking off 30 of the cannoneers. The night before, Santa Ana had silenced his guns, hoping to lull the weary sentries into napping at their posts. The dictator of Mexico, self-styled Napoleon of the West, gambler, ruthless, but charismatic politician, Santa Ana, had come a long way to do battle. 
He had crossed the river February 16th with over 2,000 men, 21 cannons, 1,800 pack mules, 33 four-wheel wagons, and 200 ammunition carts. His first act had been to raise a blood-red flag from a church steeple, a warning to Alamo defenders that there would be no prisoners. East of the town came a quick response. A cannon shot from the Alamo's biggest gun, and the battle had begun. Inside the battered walls that contained the old Spanish mission, its band of defenders numbered probably 183 fighting men as they took their places along the wall that formed the Alamos perimeter. Some manned the 18 serviceable cannons that were mounted on ramps and scaffolds along the ramparts of the church top. They carefully surveyed their scarce ammunition supply, including chopped up horseshoes, nails, and random iron pieces that would soon have to be used in their cannons. Others checked their muskets and pistol loads, shot pouches, and powder horns while they took their stations and waited. On the north wall, his double-barrel shotgun propped beside him as he watched the advancing enemy through the glasses stood the commander of the Alamos defenders, Lieutenant William Barrett Travis of the Texican Cavalry, a fiery, red-haired, 27-year-old year old South Carolina lawyer. Defending a portion of the South Wall with his dozen Tennessean mounted volunteers stood Davy Crockett, 49 years of age, a graying, legendary marksman, bear hunter, backwoods orator, humorist, and three-term United States congressman. He had come to San Antonio on February 8th, dressed in old buckskins, his fiddle and his long rifle among his sparse possessions, and leading the men he had collected on his long ride from Nacogdoches. As soon as he had heard about Santa Ana crossing the river, he and his men reported to Travis for duty in the Alamo defenses. Meanwhile, on the roof of the Alamo Chapel, helping serve the cannon there, stood Travis's South Carolina friend and fellow lawyer, Lieutenant James Butler Bonham who had journeyed to town after Travis wrote him about the stirring times in Texas. As a courier, he had made a dangerous ride out of the besieged mission compound since arriving there, about the same time as Bowie. Speaking of which, in his room in a low barracks on the southeast wall near where Crockett and his Tennesseans were stationed, 40-year-old Colonel James Bowie lay sick on a cot. He had a persistent fever and painful cough. Perhaps Perhaps pneumonia, perhaps tuberculosis. A Kentuckian, Bowie had a spotty history at best. He sold contraband in Louisiana and worthless land titles in Arkansas. He had drifted to Texas in 1828, where he married into a prominent family in San Antonio. Shortly afterward, though, his wife died of cholera. A tragedy that lorded over him like an angry storm cloud. He had ridden into San Antonio with 30 men on January 19th on orders from Sam Houston to assist in evacuating the place. Sam Houston had wanted to fight Santa Ana on a hit-and-run war style in which the Texans would move rapidly over familiar terrain and force the Mexicans to extend themselves far from their supply lines. Houston had no interest in a standstill fight and wanted all fortifications in San Antonio destroyed and the town's occupants, including those in the Alamo, to march out and join him in the open on February 24th. 
Travis scribbled a message to the people of Texas and all Americans in the world. He sent 30-year-old Captain Albert Martin, a good horseman who knew the roads, to carry it through the enemy lines. Martin was to deliver the appeal to the town of Gonzales, 70 miles away, and to have couriers take copies to Goliad, San Felipe, and Washington on the Brazos, then Nacogdoches, south to the Gulf, and on to New Orleans, and other places near and far. Travis's letter said, I am besieged by 1,000 or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison is due to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I've answered the demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you, in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character, to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. If this call is neglected, I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due his own honor and that of his country. Then, underlined three times, he closed by writing, Victory or death. On March 5th, Travis called the garrison together and announced that he believed that there would be no reinforcements. Meanwhile, Crockett told Suzanne Dickerson, wife of the artillery captain, I think we had better march out, die out in the open air. I don't like being hemmed up. But hemmed up they were that frosty morning of March 6th, 1836, at the Alamo. About 183 fighting men facing at least 10 times their number of advancing enemy. The storming of the Alamo was not so much a battle as a melee and a slaughter. The Mexican columns struck the four walls more or less simultaneously. The Texan cannons cut bloody swaths through the enemy columns until the guns could not be depressed enough to have effect. The attackers managed to prop their ladders against the scaling walls but were repelled time and time again in hand-to-hand -hand combat with sword, shotgun, pistol, and close-range musket fire that created a dense clot of dead and wounded at the foot of the wall, bodies trampled over by the oncoming waves of Santa Ana's troops. The attacking on the east and south where Crockett and his men defended had been stalled momentarily by the brutal fire from the six-pounders and the cannon on the Alamo church roof where Dickinson, Bonham, and their men furiously worked their guns. Mexican columns on the east and west sides of the Alamo then surged toward those still struggling for a foothold on the north, the result being the formation of a frenzied and disorganized mob being decimated by the fish-in-a-barrel musketry of the Texans above. Santa Ana, observing the battle from the northeast of the fortress, now called his reserves. The elite grenadiers. These 400 men rushed forward as Mexican bandsmen struck up the eerie Spanish march known as De Guelo, signifying there was be no quarter. The Alamo's Achilles heel, an ill-prepared weakness in the eastern sector of the North Wall, was now found and exploited as the Mexicans made their way into the Alamo's central compound. At about the same time on the west, the thinning ranks of the Texans could no longer fend off the enemy pouring over the wall. 
on the southwest corner. The great 18-pounder emplacement was captured and turned against the cannon on the church roof, killing Dickinson, Bonham, and their gunners. Crockett and his Tennesseans were caught in the open and in front of the church and hospital and all, or nearly all, killed. As the Mexicans captured the church, Robert Evans, the Alamo's big good humor, Irish-born master ordinance officer, though wounded, grabbed a torch and made his way to blow up the powder magazine on the north side of the building. But he fell from musket fire within feet of his objective. Santa Ana's troops by now, overrunning the entire fortress, broke into the hospital and killed 40 men there, entered each room of the barracks and shot all inside until they found the pale, fevered Jim Bowie in his cot. As Bowie rose to defend himself with two loaded pistols that had been given him by Davy Crockett, he was bayoneted to death. His sister-in-law, who was one of the Alamo's survivors, said the Mexican soldiers tossed his body on their bayonets until their uniforms were soaked with his blood. By 6.30, the fight was over. Davy Crockett had managed to survive with about half a dozen others. They were brought before the commanding general. He was quite frustrated that these men had been spared even momentarily and ordered them executed on the spot. The Mexican dead and wounded numbered about 600. Santa Ana ordered the bodies of all the Texans burned. For Santa Ana, the victory would be short-lived and bitter. On March 27th, he ordered the massacre of over 340 Texas prisoners at Goliad, including Colonel James Fannin, who had failed in his efforts to lead a relief force to the Alamo. But under the rallying cries of, remember the Alamo and remember Goliad, Sam Houston's force of 800 men met the Alamo victor and his 3,000-man army at San Jacinto on April 21st, 46 days after the fall of the Alamo. In an 18-minute battle, Houston, who lost two men with 23 Texans wounded, routed the Mexicans, killing 630 and taking 730 prisoners, included among the captives was Santa Ana, who, fearing execution, signed an order for all Mexican troops to retreat south of the Rio Grande. He was released from custody in November, and after a year's absence, he returned to Mexico, where he retired temporarily to his hacienda in Veracruz. There, he wrote, It was but a small affair, this Alamo, but Texans tend to think it was a bit larger. In 1936, the state of Texas unveiled at the Alamo a monument depicting Travis, Crockett, Bowie, and Bonham, enlisting all of the Texans who fell there. The inscription on the great sculpture summed up the meaning of the place and the battle. They chose never to surrender or retreat. These brave hearts, with flags still proudly waving, perished in the flames of immortality, that their high sacrifice might lead to the founding of Texas. I'm Michael Sean. Thanks for being at our campfire. Adios, my friends.
And with just a last bit of business we should cover here on this edition of the Free Range Texan. Uh, apparently on a Free Range Texan House of Treasures music department rebuild, somehow Medulla's music didn't get put back in. We have fixed that. In fact, we have a complete crew meeting where we all agree that's not going to happen again. So if I ask you the question, if I say Jenny Dale Lord, Jordan Robert Kirk, Stan Troy, Andy Wilkinson, Ragland, Gypsy Jane, Tim McKenzie, and Jared Medulla, what do those folks have in common? They have all been guests on the Free Range Texan in the last year or so. If you go to freerangetexan.net, you'll see what I mean. And speaking of Tim McKenzie... I saw a deal on social media that he was going to be playing live and in person at a little Mexican food place not too far from where I live. I told What's-Her-Name, we need to get in the Jeep and go out there. (laughs) That's exactly what we did on a Friday night. We were so excited. I was going to get to see my buddy Tim McKenzie. The first clue was that we had to park about a block and a half from the place because of all the cars. Could not even get a seat in the room where Tim was playing. When you are a guest on the Free Range Texan podcast, now far be it from me, besides his great talent and great Mexican food at this place where we were, and the fact that it was Friday night, far be it from me to point out he was recently a guest on the Free Range Texan podcast. I'm just saying, you can connect the dots any way you want to, folks. <laughs> we, oh, we have a good time with this show. We'll see you next Next time, take them home, sweetie pie. Thank Thank y'all for listening to the Free Range Texan Podcast, produced at ATPR Studios out yonder in West Texas, with our host, who's been voted the hardest working man in podcasting, Michael Sean. Feedback or submissions to our program can be submitted on our website, freerangetexan.net. That's freerangetexan.net. This is Sweetie Pie on behalf of Michael Sean and the crew here in Studio A, where we're all looking forward to spending time with you on our next bi-weekly episode of the Free Range Texan Podcast. Y'all come back now. You hear? Range Texan Podcast. End transmission.